Things change quickly these days. Growing up now is a lot different from growing up all those years ago in the small country town of Kyneton. There's no more running around in the backyard for us. Not that we actually did very much of that given that we had a Nintendo, but still. I grew up in different times, when we didn't have Facebook to lean on and clothing was much more fashionable. We didn't have a laptop or an iPad or a mobile phone. I didn't even send my first email until I started uni in 2001. Yet even without these things, I would say I had a happy childhood. There were still the usual pressures, of course, like worrying about how sexy you looked to impress the several people you had a crush on, or mowing lawns to help feed the family. But the idea could never have occurred to us that there would one day be things that would let you chat for free to a friend overseas, or make videos that anyone could watch, or things that could keep an eye on you when you least expect it. I think back to my childhood fetish for dinosaurs and wonder whether all the books I've kept in boxes for years and years should have been recycled long ago. Has learning about stuff by reading become outdated? Are books just boring? Don't listen to her, she can't read. But it is pretty cool when large retail stores install massive animatronic creatures to drive sales of their dinosaur merchandise. Even if it does sound more like a cow. And then there's a genius who invented interactive games to go on the floors of shopping centres to keep children out of the shops so that we can all just browse in peace. But when I'm waiting for my plane at the airport, can't I just eat my burger without being bombarded with QR codes promising to entertain me while I eat? Can't I just enjoy my food? Social media is now integrated everywhere to the extent that we might find ourselves liking things before we actually think about whether we like them or not. And cameras permeate our world to the point that we probably just don't even see them anymore. They can be benevolent, of course, and might only catch us out every now and then in a slightly awkward moment. At other times, their function can be more ominous. There are so many questions. Why, on a recent trip to the Gold Coast with my brother and sister, did they ignore the flat-screen TV in our room and instead watch programs on their mobile devices. And why, when looking for King Tut's putt-putt to play some mini-golf, did they go straight to Google Maps rather than ask someone who lives close by for directions? They were actually using their phones like this, even though they're overacting for us here. What does this tell us about ourselves? Have we changed so much? Have our previous identities just floated away in one of David Bowie's bubbles while making our way through the labyrinth of digital culture? The big question is, are we no longer the same people we were? Hi everyone, welcome back. What I just showed you there was the introduction to my very first teaching video, apart from the welcome video, and I thought it was fitting to start the, the week with this. We've got a couple of topics on online identity, and without me really thinking of it, when I did that introduction, I not really planned to, but it just became a little video essay almost on the nature of what it is to be human, and whether or not that has changed with contemporary digital media culture. And it's quite interesting that that seemed to be, almost intuitively, the major issue that I went to in terms of talking about the broad I issue. I just wanted to engage people and, and, and show them what we were going to be doing for the trimester. And even though we're only looking at online identity explicitly and specifically as a topic in itself for a couple of weeks, it does encapsulate really everything in the unit, the way in which digital media uh, is interacted with and, and what that says about us as much as it says about it. So I hope you start to think creatively and critically about all these kinds of questions around who we are and what technology says about us. As well as show you that little intro from 2013 when I started making videos, I wanted to share with you another memory, if you like, of yesterday, something a little more recent. My partner and I took Tiffany to the beach, and it wasn't planned to have anything to do with this video, it was just going to be a nice day out, and we were doing our usual thing, taking a lot of photographs of Tiffany, um, mostly Tiffany, um, the beach as well, but generally it was Tiffany, a few selfies, and 
I started to, to, to think when we were taking all these photos of Tiffany and she doesn't really comply very well. She obviously likes to do her own thing. She doesn't want to pose. She just wants to lie down in the shade or walk away or walk too close to water when we're trying to take photos. And I, just without thinking about it, asked my partner the question, do you ever worry that we spend too much time trying to get the perfect photo and that we miss out on the experience? And I even kind of felt stupid asking this question because it almost feels like a cliche to me to, to ask this, this really common question that's asked in so many different ways in so many different contexts these days. But when I asked this question of my partner, you know, are we missing out on the experience by trying to capture the moment, um, the perfect moment on the screen, she without hesitation and very confidently said, I think I still have that. Have screens and virtual personas now replaced our genuine engagement with the world or just become a part of it? Is the attempt to find that perfect photograph part of the experience itself? Is it really all that detrimental? So just a few examples to get you thinking there and there'll be plenty more coming up. But first, here's some more assignment advice. The theme of online identity is intentionally broad to allow you as much flexibility as possible, so get creative. Extra marks will be given for inventiveness. Being creative is not just about being entertaining though, it's about showing an innovative use of media generally. To take one small example, give your blog post an interesting title. And don't forget that while your creative and effective use of digital media is a significant part of this assignment and is listed among the assessment criteria, your written component is also important. Be sure to write in full sentences and paragraphs, for instance. Please note carefully the detailed advice provided in the instructions document regarding your use of images. In order for you to learn a few new things, and to avoid the commonplace, somewhat lazy, and invariably problematic quick searching of Google Images, I've limited your use of images to those that you create yourself, or those that have Creative Commons licenses. Producing your own images in the form of photographs or drawings, in effect creating digital media text within your digital media text, your blog post, is a particularly valuable way to demonstrate creative thinking and practice. And remember that visual clarity is also important. Don't go nuts with pictures and choose a blog site and template that enables you to include a lot of written and other material in an interesting but clear way. My personal preference for my blog is WordPress, but that doesn't necessarily have to be yours. Perhaps most importantly, don't leave things until the last minute. You are working with digital media that is outside the bounds of the Deacon system and may be very unfamiliar to you. When using digital media, particularly online sites, things can go wrong and marks will be deducted for lateness if delays arise due to technical issues. We do this in the interest of student equity. Depending on the media you use, you will often have access to help documents and video demos, so make use of these and research examples for ideas on how the media can be employed effectively. Don't think of my example as the template. Challenge yourself. Try something different from what you already do to enhance your digital knowledge and literacy. You might find that a particular textual form is not as useful for the particular purpose you had in mind for it, so it's important to get an early start and explore your options. You might also find it useful to write your blog post in a Word document to begin with. Keep a backup of everything. A blog post can be difficult to lose, but nothing is impossible and stay tuned for further advice as it develops from student queries. Hopefully there won't be too many of these as I've been quite detailed with the instructions, but as always, please get in touch should you have any questions. I hope you found that helpful. You've probably noticed that this video is starting to get a little bit longer than my regular digital media snapshot. And to be honest, when I planned this out in my head, I would have been hoping that it would be shorter than this myself. But I'm not going to apologize for that because in a moment or two, I'm going to say, look, if you've had enough, feel free to switch off and go and run rampant with any of the other materials because I have got no chance of covering everything I think is important, everything that I want to cover in relation to this topic in the array of different materials I'm providing you with this week, much less in this single video. Uh, you've got the debate between Jaron Lanier, a very well-regarded, experienced veteran of digital media making. He's been involved with VR and gaming, and he argues in his book that we have become automatons, that we have lost our humanity.
And you've got people on the other side, like David Gauntlet, who argue that no, social media, online media have allowed us to enhance our means of creative individual self-expression. You've got some amazing readings from a recent collection that's the first book that's really looked at the intersection between uh, the online world and life writing. And please do note that from this week onward, you've got readings that become essential. And you note that in the study guides. We've been pretty easy on you in the first weeks with lots of you know, optional readings, but more importantly, getting you active online. But please make sure that you do the preparation. The readings are not very time consuming. They're not hugely long. And in fairness to your tutors, and more importantly, in fairness to your peers, make sure you do the preparation for your seminars or even in the online discussions. You get so much more value out of your participation if it's informed by your reading of the materials. So make sure you have a look at those. You've also got my recent conversation with Emily Vandernagel, an extremely talented PhD student from Swinburne University of Technology. I talked to her about the issue of pseudonymity and social media, and it's, it's a really amazing conversation, and we've already had a couple of hundred hits because Emily's following is so big, and I've had a lot of students already communicating about the issues there. The other thing that I've brought in is the second episode of Teaching From My Car. And I look at Chinese social media and cultural identity in this, this interview I conduct as part of that. And it's a really key topic because we do deal with very Western-centric media in this unit, partly by necessity, of course, but it's really important to keep a more global perspective. I have also been collected for my seminars in the near future at least eight or nine links to articles and videos that students in this unit have tweeted out there over the break. It's amazing that this is happening. The unit, as I've been saying all along, gets built by students as much as teachers and that's the way it should be and it should only increasingly be that way and please do keep searching that hashtag explore and experience and read and watch because people are finding some really interesting things to kickstart discussion and they've essentially helped me prepare for my seminar which you know I facilitate the learning your tutors facilitate learning but we're not the sole experts on these areas. We won't know everything or hear about everything and it's so great that students are actually willing to share this stuff and I really want to express my gratitude for that. You're making the unit so much richer. As I keep saying, a lot of the unit is now on Twitter. So, you know, that's the great thing. It's not just the study notes that are being written by me, as important as they are to guide you along. So, if you want to end there, and I'm grateful for you to you if you have not already ended here. Um, let's face it, the first thing you do when you put any YouTube video on, even unconsciously as it, as it is, is to check the time. You can switch off here and go and explore these other resources. The reason why this video will keep running is that I've decided to use from a couple of years ago, some more of my own kind of creative slash critical reflections in video form on this issue of online identity and raise more questions and, and you know, use some, some more content in other ways. So if you want to keep watching, please do feel free. Otherwise, switch off, go exploring, and please share and network and communicate and keep up that fantastic online engagement that we're seeing in this unit that I will come back to in a later topic uh, and when we look at gamification in particular. But here is some more footage. Have a good week. Back to the issue of online identity. In terms of this very broad topic, we could look at everything from how we portray ourselves online, which is very, very important, to the issue of what digital media has done to the very notion of identity itself. Has technology transformed us or become part of us in some way? Think of the mobile phone. I know I personally can't leave the house without checking for my mobile as much as I check for my keys. And when I ask for any student volunteers who are willing to let me take their mobiles home for a week, the response is pretty predictable. What does this say about us? Are mobile phones now bodily attachments? Are mobiles and similar devices also fashion accessories? Why did you choose the phone cover that you have? Do you have more than one? As you can see here, there are a lot to choose from. Do you know someone who has upgraded a device, at least in part, due to its aesthetic appearance? Adam 1.0 reflected on this issue in 2013. Let's have a look. Robert McDougall, for example, has written in his recent book, DigiNation, that the iPod and other similar devices have the potential to recreate our acoustic space. 
and transform our immediate physical environments as well as our relationships to them. McDougall writes of the various ways in which personal digital music devices, or PDMDs, enable the reconfiguration of perceptual space within individualised experiential contexts. These devices afford users a relatively high resolution sound space that, when tuned properly, often replaces the perceiver both spatially and temporally. In so doing, they have the capacity to fundamentally recast the nature of personal experience. And this is very interesting for next time you're on public transport and you notice that more than half the people on the train or tram or bus are listening to music or some other form of entertainment on their mobile devices. What does this suggest? We might also consider the issue of online identity in relation to contemporary gaming cultures. I spoke about this recently to Dr. Deb Waterhouse Watson, a lecturer in media and communication and literary studies at Deakin and Monash Universities. Deb's an avid user of the Facebook game Stormfall and another hugely popular game, The Hobbit, Kingdoms of Middle-earth, which involves building up your castle and army and competing in a series of tournaments, often by collaborating with other players who are in your alliance. And because the chicken shop I filmed Deb in was too noisy, I had to get her to repeat everything outside. Here's what Deb had to say in relation to the Hobbit game and identity. It's on the King of the Middle Earth game, it's like, it's a iPhone app. At least it's an app you can get on a lot of different platforms. And everybody's known by their username, so you have an alliance with the people that you interact with in the game, the people that you work together with. And when you're chatting to those people, then you refer to everyone by their username. So you talk to Otto Axe and um, Coloss uh, Colossus and I'm WL, so everyone calls me Zena in chat. And it was a really big thing when somebody started a Facebook page for the group and everybody was supposed to join up so that we could communicate a bit better. And it seemed like people felt a little bit shy about you know, revealing who they really were um, via Facebook and so people would st be starting their post with things like okay here goes I'm you know I'm Lady LaDonna and I'm you know Margaret or whatever um, the person's actual name was and um, similarly when we had uh, when we transferred over to a new alliance then everybody started making these posts about who they really were and giving their real name and who they a little bit about themselves as I've been emphasising, it's crucial that you think critically, creatively and carefully about how you portray yourself online. Depending on what your future goals are, I'm certainly not the best example for you to follow, and I'm sure you've worked that out just by watching some of these videos. But in expanding and enhancing your own online profile, you need to think about what you're going to use, how you're going to use it, and just as importantly, why you're going to use it. How often will you tweet or blog in order to maintain a following? If you're going to use a profile picture, what's it going to say about you? Don't forget that that picture can be up there for a very, very long time. For example, if you go on a holiday to Queensland with your younger sister and she dresses you up with her blonde hair extensions and takes a photo of you, do you really want to be disseminating that around the world for all to see? <coughs> Another important point to remember is that we never have total control over how we're portrayed online. It's pretty much anyone can take a photo of us, upload and tag it, and then others can share or retweet it without us even knowing about it. So there are ethical issues involved here. Should I take a photo of my somewhat shy mother who's not all that keen on the idea and then tweet it out there for the world to see? What can my mum do about this? Well, she can have her revenge by making me think she'd come straight out of a Japanese horror film and completely creeping me out. But given that she's not even on Facebook, if I didn't delete the tweet straight after I posted it, she wouldn't know whether or not it was still up there for the world to see. And now it is again. And we also have to be aware of the manipulation of images made possible through user-friendly apps that can change your appearance. My sister's use of Face Juggler, for instance, made my parents look slightly different. And just in case you're wondering, I did have their permission. I knew that some of you would keep watching. Do you want to know the secret of how to get a high distinction in this unit? Well, since you stayed with me, to get a high distinction in this unit, you need to...